Hey everybody, welcome to the Idiomatic Top 3! I'm Nicholas, I'm the video game correspondent for Idiomatic. And I am Dimitri, editor-in-chief of Idiomatic and movie critic. And today, we are listing our respective top three beloved classics that we don't like. Yeah. Now, uh, just in case you might think that we're haters, because you gotta say it that way. Of course. Uh, what we want to explain is, 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 it's more for us a sort of exercise of humility, where there's some things we like and don't like as critics and reviewers, yeah. but we sort of acknowledge that a lot of it is subjective taste and that we can recognize why these things are beloved classics, why they are like, and then we'll explain why it doesn't appeal to our particular tastes. Yep. Yeah. All the while respecting its worth and quality, its genius in certain cases. Yeah, we're not just, you know, hating for the sake of hating or nitpicking or, you know, bitching. It's really, you know... We can or trolling, see... really. Trolling, yes. Trolling is the, the better example, yeah. We can see why this is very... Why somebody could see that whatever is very, very good, but you don't. You just don't see it. You just don't get it, or you even think it's not good. It's not for you. Yeah, Exactly. Um, and we are doing it in the spirit of sort of teaching the internet that different opinions don't need to be flamed. <laughs> oh boy, yeah, we have work to do there. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding, we absolutely have never had any such ambitions at Idiomatic or any ambitions of any kind, really. Yeah, pretty much. All right, you're number three. My number three is from a series of games, a very popular, started on Game Boy, and then Game Boy Advance and so forth, uh, the Pokemon games. I love the original, Pokemon uh, Red and Blue. Right. Uh, very, very fun. You know, you find your Pokemons, you fight with them. There's like this rock, paper, scissor thing going on. Um, then you play the sequel. You realize it's exactly the same game. And the sequels would be uh, Silver and Gold. Silver and Gold. And then they went to over and over with different materials and gems and Diamond colors. And, uh, exactly. and, and now they're black and white because they've run out of stuff. Exactly. But... It's exactly the same game over and over again. You know, if I have a Pokemon, say the Squirtle cast Bubble Beam, if I have another Pokemon that's, you know, cast the same thing, but it's just a different name with a different graphic, to me it's still the same thing. And you still have to, you know, fight gym leaders to get badges and get to the end. It's exactly the same thing over and over again with different graphics. I just don't get the appeal of playing the same game over and over again with just different settings. Yeah, and, and they have gotten a little bit sort of desperate with the new Pokemons. Like, there's one that's essentially a dog with a big mustache, and he's <laughs> called Mustache Dog or something like that. And you're like, wow, can you try harder <laughs> next time? <laughs> like... But I, I can see, you know, when I was younger, I used to play the same game over and over again. The Mega Man series is basically the same game, like, from Mega Man 1 to Mega Man, like, 7 or 8. It's exactly the same thing, and I used to love that, because if you like a concept... It's perfect for you, but eventually you get a little older and you know the, the choices of games has, have expanded so much that I can't really waste my time playing the same thing over and over again. But yeah, kids like repetition, but they also yeah. like getting new stuff. Yeah. So, and, you know, companies like to give kids new stuff for money as well. Like, you know, it's <laughs> it's a sort of the nature of commerce. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, you you make an excellent point. It's, it's, it, it, it has to be repetitive because it's the... That's the cornerstone of the franchise. You collect Pokemon. Yeah. And at, on top of that, I mean, this is a franchise. Like, when we started playing, we were a little bit old for it, let's face it. Yeah, we, we were, were probably in our late teens, if I remember correctly. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I guess we started playing around the same time. We yeah. got really addict addicted to it. I would actually... I used to play this game at night. Like, I would go to bed with my girlfriend. And then I would sneak out of bed and play... <laughs> In wow. the middle of the night. Like, that's how A, old I was and B, <laughs> pathetically addicted to this game. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, so, but that was still, you know, 10, 15 years ago easily. And uh, that means that if the franchise is still alive, it means that they're ga they're gaining a new audience, you know? It's not just the same people playing for 10, 15 years. Yeah. Which means repetition is not really an issue. You're going to attract new kids, and they've never played it before. They just get a refined version of the game, you know? Yeah, it's a good point. Mm. Although there are certain things that 
certain additions I didn't like about the new versions. Like, for example, certain... Mustache Dog? Mustache like... Dog. Is kind of, it's kind of lame, but I never saw him. But, like, certain Pokemons only appearing at certain times. So you basically have to plan your schedule around getting the Pokemon at that certain time of day. It's like, kind of busy. I can't do that. Or then you have the, the breeding center where, you know, if you want to basically play the game, you leave your Pokemon there and they level up for you. I was like, that that seems a little ridiculous to me. I want to, If I want to play with that Pokemon, I'm going to level it. Why would you just dump it there for no reason? Mm-hmm. It was kind of weird to me. But so, yeah, the features they added may, might be fine for certain people, but not for me, you know, especially the time Pokemons. Yeah, show up at night, at midnight, and you can catch this Pokemon. I want to sleep sometimes, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm mean, surprised they came up with that. That that's weird. Although, I mean, that that encourages trading essentially. Like, yeah, I don't want it. I don't want to be up at that hour. But my friend is crazy enough to be up at that hour. I'll trade with him. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, that's a great number three. Yeah. Um, what is your number three? My number three. All three of mine. Uh, uh, full disclosure: they're all movies. All okay. of them. And my number three is uh, a 1995 movie called The Usual Suspects. Okay. Now, that's a beloved classic if ever there was one. We're talking about Brian Singer's coming out movie, like the movie that made him a star director, starring Kevin Spacey and uh, Gabriel Byrne, about a bunch of criminals being arrested and they're looking for their ringleader. Yeah. And the whole movie is about them and it's told from uh, from Kevin Spacey's character point of view. And I understand why... It's beloved because it plays with the unreliability of the narrator. It's sort of a cinematic uh, interpretation of what the modernists in literature have been doing since World War One, which is to make you understand how a point of view is so unreliable, and you, as a as an audience me- member, uh, are sort of vulnerable to that. And it's it's well done, but. The reason why I disconnect with it is because it's connected to a twist ending to do that. And the twist ending is that the reality is far less interesting than the story being told at the beginning. And that always bugs me. Like, uh, when yeah. if you're going to do a twist ending, I always feel that the new reality you leave me with should be more awesome than the one you set up so that I'd be like, oh, wow, that's even greater. Not yeah. sort of like... Burp, burp, kind of felt that way too like certain movies when you watch the whole thing and all of a sudden it, it was all a dream mm. and they wake up to their like boring lives and it's like this this is not fun to me i mean this story was going somewhere and all of a sudden you're telling me that everything was just for, for nothing just a lie and then we start over with this new thing it's kind of very not satisfying really it was just a waste of time for me Mm. Start start the movie where he wakes up and let's go from there. Come on. <laughs> yeah, no. The Soul of Dream is exactly the problem that I have with uh, the usual suspects. It's because you feel like you've been taken for a ride. It's like, why did you waste two hours of my time if none of this really happened sort of thing? You know what I mean? Okay, yeah. Um, and at, at this point, you know, the usual suspects is almost 20 years old, so I don't feel that bad about almost spoiling it. Like, I won't flat out tell you what the ending is, but if you can guess what the ending is from how I'm talking about it, well, look, it's been, it's 20 years old. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the thing. It's sort of, it That movie wastes your time. Like, the difference between that and, let's say, Sixth Sense, which also relies on a twist, mm-hmm. is there's, it's twofold. First of all, the twist makes what you've seen before more awesome than it used to be. Yeah. And the second thing is, what you saw before still happened. It's just it didn't yeah. happen the way you thought it did. Yeah, it's not somebody, somebody you know, just telling lies or somebody dreaming. It, it, it actually happened. It's mm-hmm. just you did it. You didn't quite understand everything that was happening because you didn't have all the information. But now that you do, you go you go back and you're like, wow, okay, this is wow, well, it makes sense now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And of course, usual suspects can do that because it's all about the, the the subjective point of view. But it does mean that I've been taken for a ride for two hours, and it's sort of like, okay, I'm an idiot for watching the movie. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, my number three pick, the usual suspects. I know why it's smart. I just I don't appreciate it. All right. All right. Uh, let's move on to your number two pick, Nick. Number two uh, is a TV series, uh, Battlestar Galactica, the new series, not not the classic old one, but the new one. 
Um, I was, you know, my friend told me they're great storylines, and from what you know, he t- he describes them, and they are very interesting stories. And you know, the special effects are actually pretty good, pretty nice to look at. Uh, there's just one thing: all of the characters, you know, although very human, like my friend describes them, uh, very very annoying characters. I cannot stand, you know, they're on screen, and you just feel like strangling each and every one of them. And I could get couldn't get past like the f- third episode. Because I didn't like any of the characters. There was actually one character I liked. And it was a character that everybody hated. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, the XO. I forgot his name. But like everybody hated that character. And I was like, I like him. That's the only character I like for some reason. But everybody else could not stand to watch them. And if, if, you know, if I can't really follow a character along and you know, relate to that character, you know, it's, it's not a great good series for me. Yeah, I get what you mean. I mean, these are deliberately flawed characters. And that's actually probably the strength of that series yeah. what makes it uh compelling television is that it's not a tv series where everybody's just sort of perfect or almost perfect except that they're of that one personality quirk sort of like house or yeah castle or whatever uh but at the same time yeah we we're asked to invite these people into our home every week it's like a movie you can get away with having slightly unsympathetic characters because you're just spending an hour and a half or two hours with them yeah and even then you sort of have to walk that line very delicately like if they're unsympathetic you have to tell a story that's very compelling or sort of make it clear in your narrative that the movie makers know that these characters are flawed yeah but on a tv show you don't even have that luxury even if the writers of Battlestar Galactica make it clear that they know that these characters are making bad decisions sometimes. Yeah. You're still asking me to say, next week, I want more of that asshole. <laughs> like, you know? Exactly. You know, after that episode, the third episode, I was like, I cannot push myself to watch the fourth one. I mean, I see where this is going. I can see what they're building to, but I don't want to watch this anymore. It's just so, so painful to watch. I uh, worked on the DVDs of uh, the Battlestar Galactica series, <clears throat> and so I never got the luxury of actually watching them in order. We okay. got the episodes as we got them and worked on them. And uh, I have to say, I I couldn't get into it either, but for a different reason, okay. and it's too much talking. Like what it comes down to is that it was very ponderous, very serious, and very like let's talk about politics for. 45 minutes yeah and i'm somebody who's old enough to remember the original series not on their original broadcast i was too young for that but i saw them in in syndication and i mean like this is a series about that's such a blatant ripoff of star wars like a popcorn ripoff of star wars at that and that the dvd set is sold in a giant robot head I see. So for me, I was like, creators have the right for reinterpretation. Like, and as far as I'm concerned, when you make a remake, reinterpretation is a great thing. Of course. But at the same time, as I could never disconnect from the fact that, like, these people are really taking themselves seriously when you consider that their counterparts are just, like, goofy, can't be up to the hilt. You know what I mean? Yeah. And for me, it was like, well, where's the humor? Where's, like, the slight self-deprecation that I would expect from something called Battlestar Galactica, you know? Interesting. I didn't get to that that point really like late enough, so I couldn't... I was not forced to watch them. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike you. <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, I, I can see if, if you have a tolerance for that, that kind of character, it's a perfect series for you. I heard like most of the storylines are great. It's, some of them are kind of hit and miss, but most of them are very good. So, you know, very recommended, but it's just really not for me. Hmm. So what is your number two? My number two is a Academy Award winning movie. Oh, cool. 2004, Sideways, which is um, sort of a road movie about two guys, very imperfect guys, going in wine county, essentially going from one vineyard to the other, tasting wine and meeting women and being sort of assholes as road movies tend to have characters be essentially of course yeah won the oscar for best screenplay for best movie all of that and undeniably very well acted movie there is one scene in particular that arguably represents the best cinema can offer it's a it's a scene where two characters 
the girl and the guy are just talking about wine and how they feel about wine and really what they're doing is talking about themselves and how they act in relationship but all the, with the big metaphor of wine and they're communicating to each other who they are and they're connecting one to one, with one another and really falling in love at that moment all the while only talking about wine it's a brilliantly acted scene it's a brilliantly written scene uh but uh oh god that movie's boring okay and I hate the characters. It's the same problem. It's sort of like they're they're road movie characters. You know, they're sort of grown men acting like adolescents. And it's, yeah, that's always great. Yeah, it, I have such a hard time with that. You know, with road movies, I can almost sort of take it because it's a comedy and you're supposed to laugh at them. But here, it's taken so seriously. And, really? Yeah. yeah. You know, it's an Academy Award winning movie. It's that sort of movie. Oh, know? wow. And so when you're asking me to take these characters seriously, I can because they're well written. But it forces me to cast my adult judgment on them. And I hate these people. Yeah. If they're old enough to drink wine, they should kind of, you know, act that way. <laughs> Not like, you know, frat boys, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> That's it, and you're asking me to follow these characters, and I, that's one movie where I'm not entirely convinced that the writer fully appreciates how messed up they are. I mean, like, obviously, these these characters need to grow, and the, the screenplay acknowledges that, but I think it, it, they, it acknowledges that they need to grow not as much as I feel they need to grow. <laughs> I see, yeah. <laughs> so I, it, that movie really frustrates me because of that. Yeah, sorry, I did not see it, but yeah, that doesn't sound like something I would like to watch, honestly. <laughs> you usually give me like good suggestions for things to watch, but like this one, yeah, I'm going to skip. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, well, yeah, the, I, I would not recommend it to anyone, like, because it's a movie that like, it gets a visceral reaction out of me. I was like, I hate these people, I understand why I'd want an Oscar. It's like, but in reality, like, in reality, I completely understand why it won the Oscar. It's a beautifully executed movie about characters that need to be slapped the fuck out of. I see. Moving on. <laughs> All right. So we're down. Oh my god! Already, we're down to your number one pick for beloved classic that you don't like. Well, I'm sorry to do this to you because last time somebody bad mouthed these that kind of char that, that character, uh, your website got attacked mm -hmm. and uh, went offline for a while. But I'm gonna have to talk about it. Um, I did not like uh, Dark Knight Rises. What? How dare you? Everybody loves Dark Knight Rises, sort of, kind of, not really. Yeah. Well, and I don't hate it for, like, the same reasons. Like, you have a bunch of people on the internet nitpicking, you know, Batman doesn't quick, or this doesn't make sense, or a nuclear explosion would kill everybody. And I don't I don't really care about that stuff. It's Christopher Nolan, Nolan's universe. It's fine. I can deal with whatever he shows me. Yeah, I don't understand that argument anyway. Batman does quit. Like, in Dark Knight Returns, he quit beforehand. And uh, as near as I can tell, Batman at some point must have quit women. Oh! oh! Wow, you really want your website to be attacked, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> but the real problem I had with it is um, I went to see a Batman movie. You know, it's called Dark Knight Rises because I was expecting to see Batman, not, you know, crippled Bruce Wayne at the beginning. Mm. And then, okay, it's fine. He, he's getting back into the Batman groove, and then you see Batman for a total of four minutes. And then he gets his back broken and you don't see him again. And it's basically the whole movie is about everybody else except Batman. And that's not what I wanted to see. If the movie is called Dark Knight Rises, I want to see Batman. I want to see Batman doing cool stuff like he did in the first and the second one. And it's, it's really not what I, what I got. Yeah, I, I get what you're saying. You're saying you wanted to see Bruce Wayne Batman. Bruce Wayne and Batman. You know, both of them. Yeah, I, want, I want the movie to be about... You know, the same characters I saw in the, second, in the yeah. first one. Because yeah, to a certain degree, I would argue that you do see Batman in its final evolution. Because if you look at the Dark Knight trilogy, the, uh, Bruce Wayne invents Batman, goes like, Batman can be more than one man. It can be an institution. It can be a symbol. And then in the second one, he takes that symbol and says that symbol is in more than the law and it can be flexible to, to the needs of the city. It can be a bad guy. It can be a good guy. It's a symbol that's flexible. Mm -hmm. And then in the third one, it just takes that metaphor to the extreme where it goes like 
well, Batman is not even me. Like, the decisions I make no longer affect Batman. Well, even when I quit, Batman still exists. It's an institution. That's why Joseph Gordon-Levitt's character still does stuff. And Commissioner Gordon still does. Everybody can still rally because Batman is now an institution. So I'd say you get us to see a lot of Batman. Yeah. Batman in its final incarnation, you which get, is a population. You get two people, not a population, like you mentioned. The rest of Gotham City is pretty much powerless, and they're living in, like, fear. And it's it's a pretty much a giant mess until Batman comes back so you don't really see that well it's sort of in transition to that final because at the end without going to suppose but you do have a bunch of cops fighting a bunch of uh, terrorists and yeah it's and their so. job <laughs> but and and all of the people who survive like it's a sort of rallying of all of law enforcement and all the people that believe in the city versus the people who no longer do you know what I yeah mean? and and that's the thing that Batman can inspire but I get what you're saying if you know, because you, whether or not you saw Batman the Institution in the movie, you mm. didn't see Batman slash Bruce Wayne yeah. in the movie. For example, in the first movie, you know, he has he has his cool new toy, you know, the tumbler, and the scenes with that were really fun. Second one, the tumbler gets destroyed, you get the bat pod, and the scenes with that is like even better. It was like really cool to watch. He gets like you know his bat, the, the flying machine in the third one. You're gonna see, oh, he's gonna do something really cool with that thing. He just kind of flies it around, you know. He it, it's used like for one scene where he gets a missile shot at him, I think, and that's that's about it. You know, you're expecting something so much bigger, like an, an escalation, and you get like nothing. An escalation? You yeah. do get an escalation. The entire city goes into shambles, and it turns yeah, into a war zone. Yeah, but I'm mean, talking about Batman doing, you know, an escalation. What yeah. he does, he basically punches a bad guy in the face. Yeah, I, I, I got annoyed with that. Like, I I have to admit, I was like. Or like, really? Like, you lost the first fight, now do you win the second fight? No explanation as to yeah. what turned the tide. And it's not even him that beats Bane in the end. <laughs> like, come on, he, he's your enemy. I thought enemy. that was funny. He's your enemy, and it's like, yeah, okay, it was kind of funny, but still. Uh, and I did also have a problem with the bad guy. Um, Bane mm -hmm. sounded ridiculous to me. <laughs> I love him. He sounds <laughs> like Ramirez from Highlander. You know, like, he that's... He has that Scottish thing going. He sounds a bit like Sean Connery, but they gave him a sort of weird Spaniard thing at the same time. So it really is like Sean Connery doing an Egyptian Spaniard. <laughs> like, yeah, it was kind to me. I I heard it described better as you know if Sean Connery was playing Darth Vader, which is like <laughs> is actually accurate. But it it really bothered me throughout the whole movie. It's like this this does not sound right. He doesn't sound right, and it was like every time he was talking, he was doing these long speeches, and I. Really wasn't paying attention because I was like, this doesn't sound right. <laughs> I couldn't pay attention to what he was saying. Well, part of the issue is that they uh, augmented the volume uh, for his voice because uh, at test screenings, there were uh, pretty intense complaints about them not being uh, able to understand his, uh, his could, speeches. I could see that. Yeah, because this is a bit muffled and if the, yeah. vo if the sound is mixed in with everything else, it could be hard to follow. Especially, you know, it's not like Nolan has a good track record with dialogue being heard in a Batman movie. <laughs> yeah, know? yeah. Um, so I can see how that would have happened in the test screening. And so they, they sort of uh, uh, heighten his voice to make sure that everybody hears it, which makes it clear that it's sort of like, it feels like, did you voice over this? Like, it is weird. And my last smallish complaint about it is that there are certain times where the movie kind of stretches itself and you get bored. And that's why you see all those, you know, on the internet, all those, you know, f you know, podcasts or, you know, YouTube things with, you know, all, all the plot holes in, in Batman, you know, Dark Knight Rises, because people got bored. And when you start getting bored, you start to kind of nitpick. And mm -hmm. that, that, that's, that's the problem. You know, I, I was getting bored certain times. I was like, start thinking, does this make sense or not? And, you know, you start seeing those plot holes. And yeah, it was, it was not really an enjoyable movie for me. There's yeah. a couple of plot holes that also fly in your face whether or not you're bored. Like, cause I, yeah, I was into it, especially in the second half of the movie. I was like, oh my god, like that movie completely went off the rails. Like, yeah. what's going on? I, I never would have expected them to, you know, turn the Gotham into a post-apocalypse world. Like, that's messed up. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I still sort of were aghast. I was like, how the hell did Bruce Wayne get to Gotham? Like, he was in the middle of the desert without any resources. And now he's in Gotham. Like, what happened? Yeah, see, that one, the action was starting up, so I didn't really notice that one. Again, it was really when those long areas of time, like when I noticed that's not mentioned often, 
is that there's only one scientist on Earth that noticed that the nuclear reactor can become a nuclear bomb. There's only one person that noticed that. Ask anybody that lived around Chernobyl if a nuclear reactor can turn into a nuclear bomb. They'll tell you yes, you know, it, it's pretty easy to turn a reactor into a bomb, but there's only this one scientist that noticed that one for that particular reactor. And I was like... Well, in fairness, yeah. he might have been one of the few people who got to look at it. Yeah, but any any rea a nuclear reactor is, in in fact, a slow nuclear bomb. It's basically a reaction that slowed down a certain way so you can use the power. Yeah, no, no, but he's not the only scientist to know that that can be turned to a bomb. He's the only scientist who knows how to turn it to a bomb and how to turn it off. Yeah, that's that That was that kind of weak to me that they couldn't find anybody else. It was like, oh, this is so complex. There's only this one guy that can make it. Like, no, it's it's pretty much a nuclear bomb, and you know it when you build it. So <laughs> I also like that a makeshift, like accidental nuclear bomb, if you will, like it's a deliberate accident, but it's not its primary purpose is not to explode. Yeah, it can be put with a timer that tells you by the second when it's going to explode. Yeah. That I thought was kind of funny. Yeah. <laughs> but that said, again, it, it I can see how it's a very good movie. If you go to see it as like a set piece on Gotham City instead of wanting to see Batman be cool, I can see you appreciating that movie a lot and mm -hmm. thinking it's great. Like. A lot of people that said they were warned ahead of time, you know, this is it's not going to be Batman kicking ass. See it as like Gotham City, the movie. Yeah. And, I, you know, they really enjoyed the movie, but I went in there thinking, okay, Batman's going to be cool again. And now it didn't do it for me. Yeah, it's, yeah I got I, I mean, I understand completely what you're saying. It's one where I, I, I don't feel the same way. Mm -hmm. I'm one of the people who beloved the classic. <laughs> yeah. Um, and and I think I was set for it because I was following it as the third part of the Dark Knight trilogy. That's how I saw it when I approached the movie. And I remembered that Batman was an institution in that movie. You know, he even from the, at the beginning, he's not just Bruce Wayne. He's Bruce Wayne, he's Alfred, he's uh, Lucius Fox. Yeah. You know, and, and Commissioner Gordon, even in the first movie, sort of helps him get the ins and outs of Gotham. And so I was like, I already knew that Batman wasn't Batman, that Batman wasn't Bruce Wayne, rather, that Batman was a bunch of people. And he and in the second movie, they already set up the idea that <clears throat> Batman inspires the entirety of Gotham. He believes in their goodness and all that crap. And he yeah. can even inspire prisoners and whatnot. And then so by the time we got to, to the third movie, I, I knew that logically they would either kill off Batman or explore the idea of many people being the Batman or both. Yeah. And so when the movie went in the direction it did, I was sort of like, yeah, that's sort of what I expected. So I wasn't caught by surprise or disappointed by that. Yeah, I didn't follow it that way mostly because, again, I think I feel in the second one, they made, especially like the long speech at the end, they pretty much say that, you know, Batman is like the Dark Knight. You know, when Commissioner Gordon does his whole, you know, we have to chase him because... He's the hero we need, not the one we deserve, or the opposite. I don't remember. I don't know. It's a stupid speech. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I don't. It's a dramatically moving speech, but if yeah. you listen to it, you're like, "What the heck is he talking?" Yeah, about? Yeah, if you think it out of context, it's like this is completely ridiculous. Yeah. Those words should not be together. But you know, they basically point him out as yeah. the Dark Knight. So you go to the third movie, you know, Dark Knight Rises. I'm expecting you know the Dark Knight to be him, yeah, not yeah, yeah, not yeah, yeah, the whole yeah. institution. You know that that's where we left off. Yeah. In, in the second one. So that's why I was kind of not expecting the whole everybody in Gotham is now hero. I didn't quite get that. Mm -mm. Yeah, well, they, they do reframe the ending of Dark Knight quite a bit in Dark Knight Rises. Where in, at the end of the Dark Knight, it's like, wow, Bruce Wayne is such a great man. He sacrificed himself to save us from our sin. Wait. Yeah. <laughs> but that's pretty much what they did. <laughs> wow. That brings it to a whole new level, I guess. <laughs> it's like, what? But that's sort of where they went with it. And this, in the third one, they went like, you know when he did that? Yeah, that was a bad decision. Like, <laughs> Yeah. And it's sort of, okay, you, you sort of reframed that ending. That's kind of weird. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> All right. So All right. I guess we, we've talked way too long about Batman. Yeah, we or did. Well, we, we always end up talking too long about The Dark Knight Rises. It's one of those movies that needs to be debated every time. You know? Yeah, that's true. But what is your number one? My number one is a truly, truly classic. I don't know about the love, but it is a true classic. I'm talking about 1925. Oh, wow. Battleship Potemkin. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with film history, this is a movie that if you've, you go to film class, if you study in the field... You're going to encounter that movie. It is a Russian movie that sort of uh, promoted or 
invented the basic building blocks of movie making, uh, uh, parallel editing, uh, all of the editing techniques we use today are all stem from that one Russian movie. Nice. It's sort of the alphabet of filmmaking. And a lot of people will helm it as one of the most important films ever made, which I do not disagree with at all. It is the alphabet of filmmaking. But okay. here's the thing. I do not find the alphabet all that compelling. Really? 26 letters, man. All one after the other. Yeah, it doesn't move me emotionally. I use the alphabet. I re Whoever came up with the alphabet, hey, genius. Yeah. But, <laughs> you know? but whenever people tell, like, yeah, but that movie still holds up today. It still moves me. It's like, bullshit. <laughs> it's a boat. And uh, it uh, the, the captain of the boat wants to shoot at the city and the people in the boat rebel against the leaders of the boat to take them out and save the city. Yeah. That's what the story is. And it's a communist pro piece of propaganda. It's about the proletariat saving <clears throat> the people from their leaders. That's interesting. When you know about Stalin, it's not how it worked back then, but sure, okay. But that's the <laughs> yeah. basis of communism, though, yeah. in theory. In theory, yeah. And it's certainly the ideals of it, let's just say. Yeah. And so that's what the movie is. And if you're saying the movie still is still hold up today, it's more effective than old Hollywood tripe being made, which if you studied film like I did at school, you would hear a lot. <laughs> it's sort of like, that's only true if you're all communists. Because if you watch that movie and didn't turn communist, then it failed. Because that's what its goal was. Yeah, I'm guessing there's not a lot of love, not a lot of other emotions besides, you know, let's be proud to, to, to be together and be, you know. Yeah, no. So it's basically, I would say, you know, communist propaganda, if if you will. It's it's a hundred percent that it's a hundred percent that there's not even any characters in that movie in in, in a real sense. But I guess again, it's 1925. It's the beginning of, of cinema, yeah. and it's Russia on top of that, uh, USSR on top of that. It's not really a character movie, especially since its point is to show that the proletariat as a mass is heroic not an individual so there's no characters in there there's nothing it's just a it's just a bunch of people doing shit you know yeah so yeah and for me i chose that example for one specific reason is to sort of demonstrate the importance of telling apart the intellectual value of something and saying that you it moves you you love it it's not the same thing Yeah, I understand that. Yeah. yeah, it's not because it's the building block of everything you know, you you everything that that's you know comes out later that you know you you're completely you have to love it. I mean, I remember when I did research in physics, and you know I used a lot, a lot of you know papers that have like tables that we you know we needed to to you know do simulations and those papers were fundamental to me, but they were just a bunch of numbers, okay? It's not something I will enjoy reading out. This moves me, this 7.34, like, wow, I love this 7.34. No, it's just, it's something you need to build on, but you, you don't have to love it and I feel like I'm in love with this table. It's, it's ridiculous, you know? <laughs> to say that because it's intelligent, that I, I love it, it's almost sort of arrogant to me where you're essentially saying that everything that's intelligent you love. And in reality, as human beings, we're not built that way. Yeah. Like, I like the Resident Evil movies. They're dumb as a brick. Like, they're really, <laughs> really bad. Yeah. But they got a zombie with a bazooka in it, and, like, that sort of tickles my fancy for some reason, you know? One of my favorite movies, Equilibrium. Yeah. Complete nonsense. <laughs> I love it, you know? Exactly. And it's sort of like this disconnect, and I think in the theme of what we're doing in this episode, is it's it's that's the idea, is that there's... There's a difference between loving something and something being good. Yeah, exactly. And on that rather verbose note, yeah, I guess we might as well conclude. Indeed. No big joke at the end. Sort yeah. of a womp, womp, womp. Hey, it sometimes it happens. Yeah. So if you want to share with us uh, your um, beloved classics that you don't like, you can mail us at mail at idiomanic.com or post a comment at idiomanic.com if you have a topic that you want us to discuss absolutely we are up for making top threes of almost anything except tuscan milk i like tuscan milk top three favorite milk let's do that next time <laughs> that's gonna be great i'm lactose intolerant <laughs> oh. <laughs> and until then it was all a dream indeed 
A old I was and B pathetically addicted to this game. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, so, but that was still, you know, 10, 15 years ago easily. And uh, that means that if the franchise is still alive, it means that they're ga they're gaining a new audience. You know, it's not just the same people playing for 10, 15 years. Yeah. Which means repetition is not really an issue. You're going to attract new kids and they've never played it before. They just get a refined version of the game. You know? Yeah, it's a good point. Mm. Though, though there are certain things that certain additions I didn't like about the new versions, like for example, certain Mustache Dog. Okay. Mustache Dog is kind. It's kind of lame, but I never saw him. But like certain Pokemon is only appearing at certain times, so you basically have to plan your schedule around getting the Pokemon at that certain time of day. It's like kind of busy. I can't do that. Or then you have the, the breeding center where you know if you want to basically play the game, you leave your Pokemon there and they level up for you. I was like, that that seems a little ridiculous to me. If I want to, if I want to play with that Pokemon, I'm going to level it. Why would you just dump it there for no reason? Mm -hmm. It was kind of weird to me. But so, yeah, the features they added may, might be fine for Mega Man 1 to Mega Man like 7 or 8. It's exactly the same thing. And I used to love that because if you like a concept, it, it's perfect for you. But eventually you get a little older and you know, the, the choices of games has, have expanded so much that I can't really waste my time playing the same thing over and over again. But yeah, kids like repetition, but they also yeah. like getting new stuff. Yeah. So, and, you know, companies like to give kids new stuff for money as well. Like, you know, it's <laughs> it's a sort of the nature of commerce. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you you make an excellent point. It's, it's it, it, it has to be repetitive because it's the that's the cornerstone of the franchise. You collect Pokemon. Yeah. And at, on top of that, I mean, this is a franchise. Like, when we started playing, we were a little bit old for it, let's face it. Yeah, we, we were. were. Probably in our late teens, if I remember correctly. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I guess we started playing around the same time. We yeah. got really addict addicted to it. I would actually... I used to play this game at night. Like, I would go to bed with my girlfriend. And then I would sneak out of bed and play... <laughs> <laughs> in wow. the middle of the night. Like, that's how... Exactly the same game. And the sequels would be uh, Silver and Gold. Silver and Gold. And then they went to over and over with different materials and gems and Diamond colors. And, and, exactly. and, and now they're black and white because they've run out of stuff. Exactly. But it's exactly the same game over and over again. You know, if I have a Pokemon, say a Squirrel Cast Bubble Beam... If I have another Pokemon that's, you know, cast the same thing, but it's just a different name with a different graphic, to me it's still the same thing. And you still have to, you know, f fight gym leaders to get badges and get to the end. It's exactly the same thing over and over again with different graphics. I just don't get the appeal of playing the same game over and over again with just different settings. Yeah, and, and they have gotten a little bit sort of desperate with the new Pokemons. Like, there's one that's essentially a dog with a big mustache, and he's <laughs> called Mustache Dog or something like that. And you're like, wow, can you try harder <laughs> next time? <laughs> like... But I, I can see, you know, when I was younger, I used to play the same game over and over again. The Mega Man series is basically the same game, like, from hating for the sake of hating or nitpicking or, you know, bitching. It's really, you know... We can or see trolling, really. Trolling, yes. Trolling is the, the better example, yeah. We can see why this is very... Why somebody could see the, that whatever is very, very good, but you don't. You just don't see it. You just don't get it. Or you even think it's not good. It's not for you. Yeah, exactly. Um, and we are doing it in the spirit of sort of teaching the internet that different opinions don't need to be flamed. <laughs> Oh boy, yeah, we have work to do there. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding, we absolutely have never had any such ambitions at Idiomatic or any ambitions of any kind, really. Yeah, pretty much. All right, your number three. <laughs> My number three is from a series of game, a very popular, started on Game Boy, and then Game Boy Advance and so forth, uh, the Pokemon games. I love the original, Pokemon uh, Red and Blue. Right. Uh, very, very fun. You know, you find your Pokemons, you fight with them. There's like this rock, paper, scissor thing going on. Um, then you play the sequel. You realize it's exactly... One, two, three. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Idiomatic Top 3. I'm Nicholas. I'm the video game correspondent for Idiomatic. And I am Dimitri. Editor-in-Chief of Idiomatic and Movie Critic. And today, we are listing our respective top three 
beloved classics that we don't like. Yeah. Now, uh, just in case you might think that we're haters, because you got to say it that way. Of uh, course. Mm. Uh, what we want to explain is, is, is it's more for us a sort of exercise of humility, where there's some things we like and don't like as critics and reviewers, yeah. but we sort of acknowledge that a lot of it is subjective taste and that we can recognize why these things are beloved classics, why they are like, and then we'll explain why it doesn't appeal to our particular tastes. Yeah. All the while respecting its worth and quality, its genius in certain cases. Yeah, we're not just, you know, 